Thank you, brother and sister. Um, thank you, friends, for taking us this time to join us in this uh, Advent recollection. Um, and I thought the theme was very appropriate because um, last Sunday was um, Christ the King, and therefore our, our Lord reigns, really. So um, for this Advent reflection, um, we are going to take things a bit slower, okay? Instead of seeing this more as an input, maybe see this more as a um, reflection for the parish, reflection for everybody, um, so that we can really prepare ourselves for the arrival of the Lord. Okay, so I'm going to move things a bit slower. Okay, so I'm going to share screen now, starting with the gospel passage. So maybe let us take a few moments just to quieten ourselves so that we can uh, look at the word of God and allow it to um, sing into our hearts. Okay, brothers and sisters, friends, today we are going to look at this topic called staying awake for the Lord. What does it mean to stay awake for the Lord? Advent is definitely a very special um, season where we really await the arrival of the Lord. And that is the testimony of His love for us that is willing to come down on earth as a human being for us and to experience what we go through, our pain, our sorrows, our joy, our happiness. And how are we staying awake for the Lord as we wait for His arrival? A reading from the Gospel of Mark. Jesus said to His disciples, Be on your guard. Stay awake because you never know when the time will come. It is like a man traveling abroad. He has gone from home and left his servant in charge, each with his own task. And he has told the doorkeeper to stay awake. So stay awake, because you do not know when the master of the house is coming. Evening, Midnight, cock crow, dawn. If he comes unexpectedly, he must not find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Dear friends, I'm going to read the Gospel passage again. This time I'm going to go even slower. And I would like to invite you just to listen to the words with your heart and to pick out words or phrases that really struck out to you, that really speak to you. Jesus said, to his disciples, be on your guard. Stay awake, because you never know when the time will come. It is like a man traveling abroad. He has gone from home and left his servants in charge, each with his own task, and he has told the doorkeeper to stay awake. So, Stay awake, because 
you do not know when the master of the house is coming. Evening, midnight, cockerel, dawn. If he comes unexpectedly, he must not find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. We'll take a few moments just to quieten and allow the words to sink into our hearts. Brothers and sisters, if this were a face-to-face -face kind of sharing and reflection, I'll probably ask you to share the word that struck out to you. But in this case, we will just keep it for the group sharing later. But I hope you had the opportunity to have some quiet reflection time to look at the words and to see how they are connected to your everyday life, to your life as a disciple, to your life as a parent, to your life as a child, to your life as a worker, to your life as the daughters and sons of God. The first word that appears in this gospel passage is be on your guard. And for this, Jesus is actually addressing his disciples. Be on your guard is really a very serious um, way of saying things. It's, a, it's almost a warning, you know. And so if you look at the entire passage, it actually has an eschatological theme to it. Eschatology means 
the end time, where Jesus is coming back as the judge, where he's coming in his glory, where he's going to separate the sheep and the goats, which is what we read in last Sunday's Gospel, where we will be judged on how we are loved. So this passage is really about the Perusia, the second coming in glory, the final judgment, the separation of the sheep and the goat. And in the Gospel of Mark and Matthew, it was said, But as for that day or hour, nobody knows, neither the angels of the heaven nor the Son, no one but the Father. Only God knows when this moment will arrive. Nobody else knows it. These of all us, human beings. All we can do is to be prepared for this hour when it arrives. And that's why we have parables of the ten wise and foolish virgins, which reminds us that we have to prepare for the arrival of the bridegroom. We never know when he might be arriving. And if we are without preparation, we will be like the foolish virgins who are found without oil. And upon returning, after getting the oil, they found that the door has been locked and they are denied access. Likewise, the vigilant and faithful servant, Jesus said that he is the one who is blessed if the master were to return and find him at work. But woe to the servant if he thought that the master's arrival is delayed and therefore let things slack and goes about not doing his work but abusing other servants. When the master do come back, that is when he realized that it's too late, that he's been caught, not being prepared. So you might be wondering, this is the first week of Advent. Why do we have such a solemn uh, gospel passage? Why are we talking about eschatology when we are talking about Christ coming down in his incarnation, in the flesh? If we were to reflect a bit, we'll start to understand the reason, the purpose that the church has in having us ponder on the last hour, the last day, the final judgment, how it is important in all of the salvation history and Christ coming as an infant child is that salvation history being fulfilled. So if we were to look at the purpose behind this passage, it is really the church reminding us that we have to be prepared for the coming of the Lord. That he came once in the flesh, in the incarnation. He will come again in glory. Are we prepared for him? I would like to also invite you to look at the Lord's Prayer, especially the line, Thy Kingdom Come. I'm not sure whether you're familiar with the Latin version of the Lord's Prayer, but there's no there. The same line, Thy Kingdom Come, in Latin, is Eviniat Regum Tuum. The word advenia means advent. 
And Advent means arrival, approach, visit. And thus we are praying for the Lord to come to us as we desire His divine presence. But how are we conveying that desire? How are we preparing our hearts to receive the Lord? How are we cleaning our spiritual houses so that it's fitting for the Lord to stay, to abide in us? We are all familiar with the character of John the Baptist. He is the cousin of Jesus. When his mother Elizabeth heard about the news that Mary was pregnant with Jesus, John the Baptist leapt in her womb in joy. And when he is grown up, he started to preach the kingdom of God. And his advice to everyone was to repent. But John the Baptist recognized that he is not the one, he is not the Messiah. And that's why he says, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. What does John the Baptist mean when he says to prepare the path for the Lord or make straight path for him? How do we prepare the way for the Lord? How do we straighten the paths for him? I don't know whether you know about this, but Advent used to be called Little Lent. And therefore, Advent is also a period of prayer, fasting, and good works. The period of um, Advent for fasting, prayer, and good works was from 15 November till Christmas. This is still being practiced by the Eastern Catholic and Orthodox Church. And it makes sense too for any feast of the church to be preceded by fasting so that when the feast comes, it can be truly a joyous celebration after abstaining from all the rich food, we can finally enjoy the meal, the banquet that the Lord provides by dying to our selfish desires, by giving out our selfish wants, by focusing on others instead of ourselves all the time, we are bringing Christ to others and allowing Christ to live in us. Are we ready to make that sacrifice? To use this advent as a time to prepare ourselves to receive the Lord. And if you think about it, the Church continues to stress the penitential and preparatory nature of Advent in this symbolism. Even if you look at this light that I use, purple as the background, because it is the color of Advent. And you will come to the liturgy in the church, you would notice that the priests wear purple vestments, just as during Lent. And the Gloria, glory to God, is omitted during Mass. 
the only exception is on the third Sunday of Advent, when the priests wear rose-colored vestments. This is meant to encourage us to continue our prayer and fasting because we can see that the Advent is more than halfway over. And this is also announcing to us that the Lord is near and that we are about to celebrate and be filled with joy. And so Advent is really similar to Lent because it is a time for us to do soul searching. I don't know whether you are familiar with the term examine. It is something that we do in a seminary when we pray the night prayer. It is really taking a few moments just to reflect on our day. Where have we experienced the blessings of the Lord? Or when have we failed to live up as disciples of the Lord? For this, we express our gratitude to the Lord for the blessings and the things that we take for granted. And we express sorrow when we know that we have failed to love the Lord and to love our brothers and sisters. So I'd like to invite you just to take a few moments to reflect on this occasion. Especially we have gone through so much in 2020. From the start of the year, we had everything being turned upside down, topsy-turvy, when nobody could go out. We were all living in fear, fear of being contracting the virus. Jobs were affected, morale were low. Through those trials, are we able to live up as the disciples? Or have we succumbed to the temptations that came along the way? And so I invite you just to take a few moments just to reflect on what has happened. If you have a journal in front of you, maybe you can jot down a few points. Or what really brought you joy this year? whether you have lived as a disciple of Christ or where you felt you have failed and you would like to ask for God's forgiveness.
John the Baptist said, Repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. The word repent actually means to turn around or to turn back. And thus, when we say we are repentant, it really means that we are turning away from our disorderly attachment to things in passing world and turning back to God. So I wonder if, when you had that moment of silence just now, were you able to think of things that has distracted you from God, that has kept you from growing closer to Him? Have you been enticed by worldly things, by unhealthy relationship, by material things, by obsession with work, by attachments to things or feelings. These are all different forms of idolatry that we don't realize. Are we able to give them up and turn around and look God in the face and say, Lord, I am yours. And that's why we, use, we have penitential service in parishes at the end of the year. It is really to help us turn back to God. You often find people scrambling because they have not been going for confession for the year and therefore they find that penitential service is the time for them to go. But we should be constantly going for confession as often as we can because we need to have a clean heart in order to receive the Lord. Imagine you invite a guest to your house and your house is all filthy and dirt and, and cluttered. How would your guests feel? We have to make sure that the house is clean, presentable, comfortable for our guests, isn't it? What more if it's the Lord Himself who is coming to stay with us? And that's why Isaiah says, Return to Him for whom you have deeply defected, O sons of Israel. We knew in the Old Testament how the Israelites were the one who defect from the covenant. God is faithful. God is the one who led them out of exile. God is the one who um, lifted them up from the slavery. And yet each time they forget that it was God that enabled them to do so. They start to stray. They start to worship idols. They start to have the mentality that they can depend on themselves and not on the mercy of God. And that's why Advent is really a good time for us to think things through and to really allow us to have this opportunity to re reconcile with God. As I said, we should be preparing our houses, our spiritual houses for the Lord. And this is how we can prepare the way for Him and straighten the path for Him. It is really removing the obstacles, whether it's tangible or intangible, that prevent us from being close to Him, our Lord and our God. Dear friends, I'm sure you're also familiar with the story of Zacchaeus. He climbed up the sycamore tree because he was too short in stature and he wanted to catch a glimpse of Jesus. But what surprised him was when Jesus said to him, I must stay 
at your house today. The word Jesus used is, I must. It is not, I should. And this is what Jesus is telling us, every one of us here, that he must stay in, in our house today. Have we prepared our hearts for him? We know from the story of Zacchaeus how upon hearing this, he said to Jesus, I will give half my possessions to the poor and whomever I cheated, I'll pay back four times. This is Zacchaeus' repentance. This is his turning back to the Lord. Even when those around him say that he's a tax collector, he's a sinner, the Lord should not be going to his house. But the Lord saw something else in him. And that is the, the ability to repent, the ability to turn around. Are we able to do that too? Are we able to turn around and repent? And so we come to the theme of today's reflection, staying awake for the Lord. We have been talking about being on our guard, that we have to be vigilant. We have been talking about preparing the way for the Lord, cleaning our houses, making the way for Him, and straightening the path for him through reconciliation, through repentance, and through love in response. And we heard also in the Lord's Prayer that the word Advent means to come, it means presence, it means visit. If you look at the Greek version of that word, it is actually parousia. It has the same meaning. It means to come or arrival, presence or is coming. And that's why this passage is so appropriate for the first week of Advent. because it shows us that the Lord is coming, has come, and is present in our everyday life. Do we really desire Christ's divine presence? He is the Emmanuel. God is with us. Staying awake for the Lord. The true meaning of Christmas is not shopping. It's not exchanging of gifts. It is not having meals. It is actually being humble, being loving. Because that's how the Lord came to us. He came in a humble state. And the word is kenosis, which means to empty oneself. He is the second person of the Trinity, and yet he is willing 
to empty himself so that he can come to us as a human being, a true man and true God. And that's why in Philippians it is said, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant and being made in the likeness of men. This is what differentiates us with other religion. Other religions is always men seeking God. In Christianity, it is God wanting to have this loving encounter with us that is willing to come to us so that he, he can meet us where we are as human beings. To experience our pain, our sorrow. For Jesus wept when he heard that his friend Lazarus had passed on. Jesus experienced pain in his passion. He suffered humiliation when he was spit on. He was scourged. He was crucified. And yet Jesus also showed us how to love how he loved his disciples despite of what they did to him. They abandoned him on the night that he was arrested. And yet he has never put any blame on them. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus is humble. Jesus is loving. Jesus is forgiving. Are we able to imitate our Lord and God? Are we able to use Him as our model when we lead our life? Jesus is also present in our everyday life. We encounter Him in the Eucharistic celebration. Eucharist means thanksgiving. Are we thankful when we attend the Mass? Are we able to see that we are encountering the Lord through the bread and the wine? Are we able to feel His love for us whenever we consume Him? Are we thankful that this is the Lord who is love. So, whenever we have the opportunity to attend the Eucharistic celebration, especially given now that we are more restrained because of the mask, we have to sign up for the different masses. But each time when we come before the Lord at the Eucharistic table, let us remember that the Lord is present. Are we able to say to Him, Lord, I'm ready for You. I'm ready to receive You into my heart. And we also know that Christ is coming. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We were reminded at the start that we don't know when this hour will be. The early Christian thought that this will be something very soon. They were anticipating the Lord's return in the very near future. But we have been reminded by Jesus to be vigilant because we, know that we will never know when that day will arrive. Only God will know. And by being vigilant, 
it means that we have to be constantly be on our toes. We have to be constantly be prepared for the arrival of the Lord. Can we say that with confidence that we are ready and prepared for Him? Have we been living our life in a way that brings Christ to others and allow Christ to live in us? Or have we, have we been indulging in our own selfish desires? Have we been taking advantage of other people?
So brothers and sisters, we will now take some time just to reflect on these questions. After this, I will um, ask Susan to help to divide us into small groups so that we can do the small group sharing. And maybe just take down this question so that we can reflect on them. And in a few moments, we are going to the breakout sharing. Thank you. <laughs> 